Now to the latest challenges for Pakistan, the Taliban and Nikki Haley. I'll explain. Let's start with Nikki Haley. She is running for the White House and taking aim at Pakistan. Nikki Haley says if she's elected, she'll cut American aid to Pakistan. Why? Because Pakistan is quote-unquote in the pocket of China. The latest exhibit was seen just last week. Pakistan got another $700 million from its largest creditor, the Chinese. Not for the first time and definitely not the last. But will this money end up in Afghanistan? I'll tell you why I asked this. Pakistan is struggling with the TTP, the Tehreek-e Taliban, another homegrown terror group now challenging their grip on power. So Islamabad sought help from Kabul to clean the mess. Kabul says it will help if Pakistan is ready to pay. Our next report has more. Nikki Haley is running for president. Like any presidential contender, she's spelling out her policy. And Pakistan has reason to worry, courtesy its iron brother China. Because Nikki Haley says China is America's enemy number one. The number one threat we have is China. Republicans and Democrats for too long thought that if we were nice to China, they'd want to be like us. That's narcissistic. They don't want to be like us. They want to be communists. Really Haley wants to up the ante. She wants to cut American aid to countries like Pakistan, who she says are in China's pocket. I'm quoting what she said. Belarus is in the pocket of Russia, Zimbabwe in the pocket of China, Pakistan in the pocket of China. I will cut every cent in foreign aid to countries that hate us. A strong America doesn't pay off the bad guys. The pitch to cut American aid to Islamabad is not new. Haley's competitor and former President Donald Trump had suspended $1.3 billion in aid for Pakistan in 2018. The reason? Pakistan's track record of harboring terrorists on its soil. Republicans defended the decision saying Pakistan killed American soldiers. We were giving a billion dollars in military aid to Pakistan who was turning around harboring terrorists that were trying to kill our American soldiers. We don't give that billion dollars to Pakistan. Over the past two decades, the U.S. is said to have given over $32 billion in direct aid to Pakistan. Haley's latest remarks come at an interesting juncture. Less than a fortnight back, Pakistan's foreign minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari met China's top diplomat Wang Yi. This was at the Munich Security Conference. They were seen exchanging customary pleasantries, but the real agenda was clear. Islamabad needed funds from Beijing. Its economic crisis was worsening. Foreign exchange reserves dipped to under $4 billion. And China came to Pakistan's rescue again. Days after Bhutto's meeting, Beijing offered a fresh loan worth $700 million to Pakistan. This will add to Pakistan's huge pile of debt from China. As per the IMF, 30% of Pakistan's foreign debt is owed to China. That's roughly $30 billion. Also, Pakistan is aiming to refinance Chinese loans worth $2 billion. It's a glorious mess. Now add the Taliban to the mix. They want Pakistan to pay up. What for? Disarming terrorists. This story is about the TTP, the Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan. <laughs> They've gone on a rampage in Pakistan, storming police stations and killing security personnel. They're challenging Islamabad's grip on power. This group functions in Pakistan with the blessings of its masters in Afghanistan. So Pakistan took up the matter with Kabul. A high-level delegation led by Defense Minister Khwaja Asif went to Kabul last week. It presented the Afghan Taliban with quote-unquote irrefutable evidence of the TTP's involvement. And what was Kabul's response? It said the TTP does not have any basis in Afghanistan. Then they made an offer. Afghanistan will help disarm the TTP, but Pakistan will have to pay for it. It will have to bear the costs of disarming and relocating the fighters. How many of them? Around 12,000. Add their families and the number touches 30,000. Pakistan doesn't have the money to take care of its own people. Can it spend on rehabilitating terrorists? It's best to conclude with the words of India's Foreign Minister S. J. Shankar. No country is ever going to come out of a difficult situation if its basic industry is terrorism. 
And finally, Monday blues and hangry moods are best friends. Hangry refers to a potent combination of being hungry and angry. If you miss breakfast today in a rush to reach work, you probably know what I'm talking about. Our last story tonight is about skipping meals. And this one may simply make you angry. Skipping meals or intermittent fasting is all the rage these days. A lot of people swear by the concept. I'm sure intermittent fasting has its benefits. But according to a new study, it may also be linked to cancer. This is a recent study by a school of medicine in New York. It says intermittent fasting could increase the risk of cancer. It may also result in higher chances of cardiovascular diseases. Now, first things first, what is intermittent fasting? It involves switching between days of fasting and days of eating normally. It can be done in several ways. One such type of fasting is time restricted. It's fairly common among those who are trying to manage their weight. It narrows the eating time to six to eight hours. When someone does eat, they opt for healthy options like fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Also drink water and unsweetened beverages. It sounds like something that will help in bodily function, but researchers say otherwise. They carried out a study on mice. They fed these mice at different intervals, sometimes restricted their intake of food, and then drew their blood at different time periods for analysis. Their white blood cell count fell by up to 90%. Now, white blood cells are the cells that help fight diseases. They control inflammation. They eliminate damaged cells from the body. So what does the study show? That skipping meals can trigger a response in the brain, and this negatively affects immune cells. In other words, fasting, according to this study, is bad for your immune system. It doesn't matter if fasting is for a few hours or for 24 hours. It can make it difficult for the body to fight off infection. This has led to a better understanding of how chronic fasting may affect the body. Now, we understand this may come as a shock. For as long as we can remember, people have had fasts for religious reasons, across cultures, across religious philosophies, including Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Taoism, Hinduism. Various religions believe in fasting, in the concept of fasting. Others have done it for specific health benefits. Intermittent fasting has been one of the hottest diet trends for more than a decade. There are millions of social media posts about it. Study after study has hailed the benefits of dieting and fasting. In the past, they've said that fasting promotes blood sugar control. It improves blood pressure and helps with weight loss. How does that happen? Fasting makes our bodies go through several changes. It adjusts to the lack of food. There are decreased insulin levels, increased fat burning, decreased inflammation, and changes in hormone levels. From our grandmothers to the Kardashians, a wide range of people have promoted fasting. But this new study says otherwise. It has delved into the fundamental biology of fasting, and it hits the breakfast skippers the hardest. There is a cost to fasting that carries health risks. The nervous and immune systems constantly communicate with each other and depriving ourselves of certain nutrition can harm the cells. This is what the new study says. Scientists have also found that along with the heart, fasting affects the brain. It elicits a stress response. So feeling hangry is not a pop culture phenomenon. Skipping meals actually makes you angrier. But it's one study against the other. And we must underline the fact that this latest study is still at a theoretical stage. So further research is necessary to expand the findings. But for now, we leave you with a quote. To eat is a necessity, they say. But to eat intelligently is an art. What do you do when your country is on the verge of collapse? When you have no hope left for your motherland? Many leave in search of a better life for themselves and their children. For many of them, the West shines as a beacon of hope. They risk everything to get to European shores, and often they lose everything in the process. A boat carrying migrants has capsized off the coast of southern Italy. Dozens died as the rough seas tore their ramshackle boat apart. The migrants were from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, and Somalia. So desperate were they to leave their crumbling nations that they decided to brave one of the world's most dangerous migration routes. Our next report brings you the details. Before the break of dawn on Sunday, the southern Italian town of Crotone awoke to a tragedy. Dead bodies had started washing ashore. A ship had capsized off the Italian coast. 
The ship may be too generous a way to describe the dinghy. It was a wooden boat, too small and fragile to survive the rocks near Craton. The boat was ferrying about 170 migrants. It carried families, including young children. The migrants were from countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran and Somalia. Countries ravaged by war, plagued by economic crises, bereft of opportunities. These people left their homes looking for a better life. They boarded the questionable boat in Turkey. They were promised a better life if they set sail for Europe. Instead, for many, the boat brought death. After the boat capsized, Italian rescue workers were at the beach for hours. They worked frantically to try and rescue any migrants that washed ashore. The rough seas and crashing waves hampered rescue efforts. By the time the sun set, almost 60 people were confirmed dead. None of the children who had undertaken the journey survived. A one-year-old was among the dead. Around 30 people were still missing. The death toll is likely to rise. It is a day of grief for Calabria. This is a struggle that falls into a general indifference. Calabria is a region that welcomes people. Last year, we welcomed 18,000 migrants, but we can't be abandoned by Europe. This type of tragedy should have been avoided the day before and not lived how we are living it today and how we will live it tomorrow. Italy's Prime Minister, Giorgia Meloni, expressed sorrow at the deaths. She blamed human traffickers for the disaster, people who charge a fee to smuggle the desperate migrants into Europe. They were involved in this accident as well. During the operations, an alleged smuggler was also identified, together with the Carabinieri patrol. And investigations are currently underway to ascertain responsibility for three other alleged smugglers, also of Turkish nationality, who are currently on the run and the search is ongoing. Every year, thousands cross the torrid Mediterranean Sea to seek greener pastures in Europe. And every year, hundreds die. It's considered one of the world's most dangerous migration routes. 20,000 people have died or gone missing at sea in the central Mediterranean since 2014. UN estimates say the Mediterranean has claimed more than 220 this year alone. Yet despite the obvious dangers, people continue to try and cross into Europe. Even though Europe is reeling from the war in Ukraine, it's still preferable for the migrants compared to their battered home nations. Migrants try and land in southern Europe and then make their way up. Northern Europe offers them refuge and a chance at a better life. And can you blame them? The choice is often between dying at sea or dying at the hands of their brutal, ineffectual government. At least with migration, they're given a small glimmer of hope. And finally, it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Starting with India, the South Korean ambassador and embassy staff danced to Natu Natu, the Golden Globe winning song. Prime Minister Modi called the performance lively and adorable. In Israel, tens of thousands of people protested in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's judicial reforms. In Turkey, it rained stuffed toys during a match in Istanbul. These toys will be donated to earthquake survivors. In Kyrgyzstan, people played a traditional sport which possibly dates back to the days of Genghis Khan. In Russia, a giant bonfire was lit to mark the end of winter season. And in Sydney, Anthony Albanese participated in a pride parade, becoming the first Australian Prime Minister to do so. We're leaving you with these. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
su görüntüler. Deprem zede çocuklarımızın yüzlerini bir nebze olsun güldürebilmek An Indian becoming a UK PM. Well, it's not like that we are going to get the Kohinu back. <laughs> <laughs> but at least India is on its way to the top, huh? But Gautam sir, there's actually not much to celebrate. Why not? An Indian is ruling the UK. Indian leaders in third countries often tend to overcompensate for their minority handicap. Key. For example, Sunak's Home Secretary of Indian origin, Suela Brahman, disapproved of India-UK free trade because it would encourage people immigrating to the UK and the majority of whom were Indians. Structurally, India and UK have passed baggage, but still hasn't been resolved. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, India needs to significantly temper its expectations from Rishi Sunak. Presenting Vantage with me, Palki Sharma, a first-of-its-kind global show with an Indian perspective. Mismanaged vaccination drive, broken healthcare systems, citizens taking matters into their own hands. India's failure in managing the COVID-19 crisis is staggering. Want stories but without the West spin on it? Presenting Vantage with me, Palki Sharma, a first-of-its-kind global show with an Indian perspective.